Our Lord issues a challenge today that I admit I struggle with as well. He says, once again, If anyone comes to me without hating his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Wow. Lord. Really? Seriously? So, what does he mean? He's using Middle Eastern hyperbole, so it's actually very good to have a guide to walk us through this for a moment. But what he's saying is not wishing evil upon these relationships. There's two definitions of hate in that sense, right? One is the opposite of love, to wish evil on someone. That's a possible explanation, but it doesn't seem that way. The second definition of hate is to prefer one person over another. And that's what's the use in Scripture. Genesis 29 has the same kind of language with Jacob, Rachel, and Leah. This is what it says in Genesis 29. So Jacob loved Rachel more than Leah and served Laban another seven years. When the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb, etc., etc., it meant that she was prefer that Rachel was preferred over Leah. That's what it meant. So the Lord himself speaks in this tone, in this way. If you prefer your husband, your wife, your children, your brothers, your sisters, your possessions above me, then you cannot be my disciple. That's what he's saying. Still, quite a hard challenge he issues. I admit I've had to experience some of this in my life as a priest and as a seminarian. I spent four years at St. Thomas, four years in Rome, in a foreign country, two years of which I could not come home. So for two full years, I did not see my family except through Skype and bad connection and all of that. And I felt this detachment from them that just naturally occurred. And then when I came back, I was assigned to Hibbing, you know, a couple hours or so from my home area. And that's where all my friends and family still live. And then the, beyond that, I was sent to Washington, D.C. for two years. And then Deer River, and now Chisholm and Buell. And so each one of them has not been in my home area. And I've had to detach myself from those relationships which I love. And I love them. I love my family. Last weekend at the 10 o'clock Mass, I honored my father and mother trying to fulfill the scriptures, and I do love them. And I, my love for God has actually deepened my love for them, even though they're not near me now, physically. They are nearer now in my heart than they were before, and I'm much more grateful knowing that the time I did spend with them was a gift still. Now, what the Lord is emphasizing here, if we are his disciples, is that we set our priority that he is to be loved and cared for and in that relationship to be the strongest in our life. And he's allowed that as a challenge because he's given us the strength to follow through on that, to shift our allegiances, our covenant to the highest one being with him and ourselves. That should be the highest. That is the one that will save our souls. Our friends and family, we love them. There's, there's no downplaying that. But they will not save us in the end. No doctor, no surgeon, no bank account, no amount of friends, no large, loving, warm family around us will save our soul. Only Jesus Christ himself will. Therefore, that relationship he is saying, this is a big deal by the language he uses. This is a, the biggest deal there is. And so if we do set that priority, Jesus, you are the love of my life. You have saved my soul and therefore my life, my whole life, because that animates my body, the soul. So therefore you saved me. The rest of my relationships are all a plus, are all a gift are all to be thankful for in our lives, in our hearts. Thank you, Jesus, for that. Then our priorities are in order. But this is 
a challenge. I've, I've had to search my own heart as a priest when this is my life, that my only inheritance and family is really the Lord. I myself struggle with this because sometimes my heart is given to different things, even like just I want the parish to, to be a certain way. But I have to detach myself from even that because I cannot control that <laughs> as much as I try to lead it. The Lord and that relationship should be where I really place my hope, where I really place my priority. This is hard because I've been in a lot of public contexts around lots of good families and receptions and really a lot of warmth and good, true love. And the Lord is never mentioned. And it sort of shocks me at times because I'm like, man, he gave us all these relationships. We're thanking each other. But do we ever think of that one? I mean, that's, that's a challenge. And Lord, if I place my love in the things and persons around me, am I placing them above you? We can tell this when our moods change, when a relationship is ruptured and our mood just is totally thrown for a tizzy and our, our peace is stolen. That shows us that we've set our priority incorrectly on this relationship or on these possessions. Like say a, a car breaks down, you know, <laughs> that's, that's another one that can really frustrate us. But it shouldn't frustrate it, us too much because it has nothing to do with our eternal salvation. Nothing to do with it. So to be anxious about these things, is it really worth it? In the end, our life passes so fast. What this then means for our everyday life is more of an interior attitude of detachment to our relationships and possessions, but not ignoring them or downplaying them either, but setting the priority with God, and then all the others will be filled with life and perspective so we hold our relationships and our possessions. We hold them. We take care of them. We nourish them. But we hold them loosely. I hope that's clear. You hold them loosely so that you are ready to offer them back to God if he calls someone home, if he calls us home, because the relationships we have in this life, they've been forged in this life, and they end in this life. They take on a new form in eternity. There's no doubt about that. But the Lord himself will show us greater truths. He will show us greater love. If we hold that in detachment, he'll show us these relationships and possessions all as gifts. Our attention on them is no longer filled with tension, but with gratitude, with thank you, Jesus, for these things. And there are days, of course, too, when those relationships and possessions make us change our tone a little bit. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Mm, mm. Thank you, Jesus. But we should still say thank you, especially in the challenging times. I've tried to do this. That's a challenge. When you have a struggle with an individual or with a collective institu institution or our job, we can say, thank you, Lord, for this particular person, this lovely child of God. Thank you, Jesus, for them, because they're challenging me. And they're challenging me to love in a greater way. They're challenging me to be better. But my priority is my relationship with you, and you will help me now. There is no problem, no difficulty, too much that you and Jesus cannot work it out together. And let's do that. Lord Jesus, all of our relationships and our possessions, all that we have and possess, you have given them to us. We offer them back to you in thanksgiving and praise. We ask for nothing in return but your grace and your love. With these, we will be rich enough and will desire nothing more. Amen.